welcome back to those of you that we haven't seen in a year, or at least since last April. Uh, it's always nice to see familiar faces every year. Um, this is our lecture series for this year with this beautiful, I don't know if all of you got this, with this beautiful um, illustration by Scott Bluedorn, who's a local artist. We think it's pretty Incredible. Cool. Beautiful, right? Yeah. So this uh, lecture tonight is about shipwrecks, but in the coming months, let's see, February we have first house, second house, and third house, which will be very interesting with Bob Hefner. Uh, in March we have Living from the Land, Farming and Wainscot by Hilary Malecki, and she does a great job. And then in April, our own Richard Barons is going to do Smokestacks and Nap Peak, which is about the Manhattan fishing industry. So we have a really good uh, set of lectures this year, and I hope you'll come to every one of them. Tonight, um, Henry Osmers is going to speak with us. Henry is the chief, the historian of the Montauk Lighthouse. He has spoken to us previously about Montauk Lighthouse and also about Camp Hero, and he always does a wonderful job, so we're looking forward to what he has to tell us tonight. And um, thank you very much for coming. people in here tonight and I said to somebody, boy, I better be doggone good. <laughs> I hope you all applaud that well when I'm finished. I hope you're still here and I hope you're still awake. <laughs> well, more lights out, we can go to sleep. Uh, this first image that I have up here is um, the cover of my book, which uh, I'm drawing from heavily on the talk tonight. Uh, I've worked, I've worked at the Montauk Lighthouse since 2001, uh, and I am not a Montauk resident, I am not an East End resident, so I'm certainly not a Bonnaker. Uh, I am from Shirley, which is from here about 40 miles to the Lighthouse, 60 miles. But I've, I've had a love of the Lighthouse uh, pretty much my whole life. Uh, can people hear me in the back? No. Oh, no. Yeah, they, the volume's off on the mic. And it should be closer to your... There we go. you got to eat the mic. How's that? Better? <laughs> okay. Uh, I, I, was just drawn to, I was drawn to the Lighthouse really as a, a young person. And I never dreamed one day I'd actually end up working there as a tour guide, and then being selected as a uh, as the historian of the lighthouse back in 2009, which was right after I had done my first book, which was appropriately enough the history of the lighthouse. But then other subjects came up, uh, as was mentioned by Barbara about the Camp Hero. Uh, I did a book on the military history of Montauk. Uh, did another one about life at the Lighthouse in the 1930s and 40s, where I actually spoke to people who lived there as young people. But I always kept coming back to the thing about shipwrecks. Montauk kind of lends itself to that because of the geography, surrounded by water as it is on three sides. And not just the shipwrecks, but I wanted to also include the lifesavers. Those, this group of men just intrigued me so much. I mean, how brave they were to uh, launch a boat into rough seas to try to save people. I just kept coming back to that. And from a quote that I had seen, the title, A Legacy of Valor, I think really fits the, 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 the kind of uh, performance that these men did. So we're gonna look at a little bit of that uh, it's actually three parts. We're going to look a little bit at the life-saving service. I'm not going to go into it very heavily. Uh, then I'll describe the three life-saving stations that, that existed at Montauk. And then we'll look at some sample shipwrecks. My book covers 120 wrecks. We're not doing all 120. <laughs> uh, I picked out 15. Uh, they're, they're very, they vary in their description and their results. They're not all tragic, some of them are kind of funny. Which, so every time a boat had a problem, it wasn't necessarily automatically a destroyed vessel, you know, and where lives were lost and things like that. Sometimes there was a touch of humor to it, and well, you'll see as we move forward. Uh, next. 
I want to begin with a quote from a news, an old newspaper. The broken skeletons of wrecked vessels with which the beaches are strewn and with, with which the ever-changing sands are busying themselves, here burying and there exhuming the unmarked mounds with the graveyards of the scattered elements abound, sorrowfully testify to the vastness of the sacrifice of life and property which these inexorable shores have claimed. That was a quote from the Brooklyn da Daily Eagle on March 18, 1877. There were various parts of the Atlantic that were for, referred to as graveyards of the Atlantic. One of them was right off Long Island. And at some point, it, it was determined to have some sort of uh, organization of men who would kind of help ships in distress. And it really had its beginnings with an organization called the Humane Society of Massachusetts, which began way back in 1789. And it started very kind of a ragtag operation. Uh, some shelters were built and uh, some boats were stationed along the coast. So that was really the first mention of any kind of life-saving service. I'm using it loosely. Uh, with the growth of shipping, the Secretary of the Treasury, Alexander Hamilton, created the Revenue Marine in 1790 to enforce the Tariff Act of 1789, excuse me if I'm reading directly instead of talking, uh, which was to protect American goods and stop the smuggling of foreign products into the country. However, life-saving efforts were handled by groups of unorganized volunteers who basically did what they could with what they had. Uh, one quote said, if anything unusual was sighted along shore, the family horn was blown, which would signal the next neighbor passed on. At the sound of that horn, every man left his plow, trowel, shop, or sermon, and made for the beach. Then in 1848, a New Jersey congressman by the name of William Newell appealed to Congress for $10,000 to provide equipment to assist people who were victims of shipwrecks along the Jersey coast. This Newell Act, as it was called, established life-saving stations between Sandy Hook, New Jersey and Little Egg Harbor, which is just above Atlantic City. The next year, 1849, the Life-Saving Benevolent Association of New York was established, which included the creation of 24 stations along the shores of New Jersey and Long Island, including one at Amagansett. They were administered by the Revenue Marine, which later became the Revenue Cutter Service, within the Treasury Department. By 1855, there were 15 stations on Long Island, including two at Montauk. One was at uh, Ditch Plains, and the other one was in an area called Hither Plain, which is a little, eh, a little bit west of uh, where the main town is today. And there was also a boathouse on the grounds of the Montauk Lighthouse. But nevertheless, even with these advances, they were still manned by volunteers with no formal training. Then along comes a man by the name of Sumner Kimball. He started as a clerk in the Treasury Department in 1862, and nine years later, he worked his way up and became chief of the Revenue Marine. He succeeded in gaining an appropriation of $200,000 to employ crews of surfmen wherever it was necessary and for as long as they were needed. He instituted six-man crews at all stations, built new ones, drew up regulations. In short, he made the service a respectable and professional organization. By 1878, the growing network of life-saving stations in the nation was organized as a separate agency of the Treasury Department and was given the name the United States Lighthouse Service. Kimball was named as General Superintendent of the Service, and this is a position he would hold for the entire existence of the organization, 37 years. 
<coughs> that's dedication. Uh, the only thing that stopped him was in 1915, the U.S. Coast Guard was created. And then any, any of these agencies were brought under the umbrella of the Coast Guard. The overall success of the life-saving service under Kimball on Long Island can be measured by the fact that only one Long Island surfman lost his life during the entire course of the organization. And that, and that, that happened at the Meacock Station at Bridgehampton where he drowned. But only one man. Not a bad record. Next. I know it look, kind of looks like, what do they call those things? Uh, zip line, yeah. This is a breeches buoy. Uh, this was a piece of equipment that I found rather interesting. They would, uh, if a ship was in distress, they would shoot one of these uh, by using a Lyle gun. They would shoot the a line out to the ship. Uh, a Lyle gun was like, had like a two and a half inch size barrel. The barrel itself was about two feet long. It wasn't very big but it would propel the line out 700 yards if it had to. And then they would secure it on the ship, usually to something firm like a mast. Then they would tie it off at the beach, and then attached to it was this little harness where one person at a time could ride from the boat to land safely. They had an extremely high rate of success with these during the course of the service. Uh, records that I've found seem to indicate only two Long Islanders lost their lives and one of them lost them because, unfortunately, he was rather portly. And that kind of bowed the line a little bit, if you know what I mean. And the waves swept up and swept them right out of the harness. But these proved to be very successful. Now, if the Lyle Garden couldn't reach the ship with the line, then they would, they would get into a dory and row out there. And that's where the fun started. Because what they would do is they would sit on the beach and wait for a break in the high waves, and then the captain would scream, shove her in. And that was the signal for them all to push this thousand-bound boat into the water and then row with all their might to get out to the ship and do what they could. All I could think of is, wow, these are some kind of guys. At its peak, there were 30 life-saving stations on Long Island. And by 1898, they were all manned 10 months out of the year. Usually in July and August, they weren't manned. But by the early 1900s, Sumner and Kimball had changed that, and it was year-round that they were manned. <clears throat> now, Kimball wanted to make sure that the public was aware of all these good happenings that the service was doing, so each year he published an annual report, which included the descriptions of actions taken by surfmen in wrecks and rescues, and giving the overall impression of the usefulness and necessity of the service itself. The service had a motto. The motto simply was, you have to go out, you don't have to come back. <laughs> Not my words. <laughs> then in 1915, President Woodrow Wilson created the Coast Guard, which combined the Revenue Service and the Life Saving Service. Although the original service under Kimball is long gone, uh, the service per performed its duties nobly during, during its years. Uh, Sumner's organizational skills actually continue today. They provided the, the basis for the new Coast Guard search and rescue operations, and the constant attention to practice and with rescue equipment and inspections continues to this day, but it all started with Sumner Kimball. So thank God for a man like him who brought organization and confidence uh, to people because once they knew the lifesavers were there to handle things, things, they were in good hands. Now, next one. Now we start to take a look at uh, some of the stations. Uh, since I work for the lighthouse, you know you're going to see pictures of the lighthouse. <laughs> this is, this according to what I've been able to find, is the earliest known photograph of the light. It dates from 1871, and for those of you who are familiar with the lighthouse, and I assume everybody is, you'll notice the brown stripe in the middle of the tower is not there. That's because it wasn't added until 1899. It was known as a day mark, and it helped identify a lighthouse from the distance. 
The keeper's dwelling, which is immediately to the left of the tower, is a little smaller than the keeper's dwelling today because uh, additional rooms were added on in 1912. But the house itself, it's, the house itself housed three keepers, a head keeper and two assistant keepers, and their families. As far as a life-saving station goes, a 10-year lease was obtained for a lifeboat station here in 1853, which was situated on the shores of Turtle Cove, which is pretty much the, uh, the spot that this picture was taken from. It's down towards the cove. Paid, paid, paid surfmen took over the maintenance of the lifeboat station in 1871, and the keeper was listed as being the lighthouse keeper. But that wasn't always the arrangement. Later on, the equipment was maintained by the Ditch Plains Coast Guard Station, which was actually four miles down the beach. When the Coast Guard came along in 1915, this facility was discontinued and the boathouse was removed. Uh, there is the boathouse. You can see it there. Uh, no doubt this shot was probably taken from up in the tower. And that's Turtle Cove that you see right in front of you here. And next one. And you can see at the lower right, there's a boat. The actual boathouse would have been just to the right of that out of view. Uh, this is an image from uh, about 1910. Next one. The next one down the beach was the Ditch Plain Station. This is an image that dates from about 1886. Uh, it started out having a boathouse, just like the lighthouse property did in 1855. But in 1886, a new building was constructed, which you're seeing here, which nearly burned down by a fire two years later. But what finally did it in was in 1891, the building was struck by lightning in February of all months. And it not only destroyed this building, but the original 1855 structure on the property also went up in flames. But the captain of the station, a man named Samuel Stratton, had a home nearby, and he took the entire crew in, and they stayed there until a new building was built in 1892. Here's your new building. This is a shot from 1894. Looks like the crew is ready to go. Got their equipment and everything. Uh, with, the poten with the potential for America's involvement in World War I, a watchtower was added to the property in 1917, and personnel were armed with Navy rifles and, and revolvers while they were on patrol. A new two-story frame building was built in 1934. Here's a look at the property in 1921. And next one, right there in the, in, at the front, you can see the watchtower. This is, this is a view from uh, the, the World War II period. During World War II, improvements were made to the station. New equipment was added, dwelling repairs, three rescue boats. The station actually ended up being active into the 1950s. Many of them had already closed down when the war ended. But then it was announced that a new station, the Coast Guard Station in Lake Montauk, was going to be established. And having the Ditch Plain Station would have been redundant. So the, this station closed down in 1955. A couple of buildings from the, uh, uh, from the station were relocated to uh, Star Island, where the current um, station is located. Sir, sir is, that, yeah. is that garage still on the property of the trailer park? Yeah. Uh, the, the garage. The garage on the left in the picture? That one? Yeah. Uh, that I don't know for sure. I, guess I heard someone say yes. Okay. That one still is there. And the yellow building of the house is at the <coughs> manor that's on Benson. Right. Uh, hit the next picture and you'll see it. <coughs> perfect. Perfect segue. Yeah. The main house was saved. That was moved over to Benson Drive in uh, 1955, and it still sits there today. Beautiful house. Yeah. 
that uh, actually are where it's located. It's like a dead end, the, the dead end section of Benson Drive. Next. Further down the beach, you had the Hither Plain Station. Uh, the way that developed, it, it was very similar to Ditch Plains. Land was conveyed in 1855, but records show that the first station building was there by 1872 and enlarged three years later. Its location was listed as being one half mile southwest of Fort Pond. Its actual site, for those who uh, are familiar with the area, it would have been south of Montauk Highway, pretty much right across from where Washington Street comes in, or Washington Avenue. I think a lot of that land now is part of what they call the Benson Reservation. This is the station in 1917, again, around World War I. And like Ditch Plains, a watchtower was added, and personnel were armed when they were on their patrols. A boathouse was added in 1918. Now, although the station was deactivated in the early 1920s, it was soon reopened because of prohibition, <laughs> which kind of kept folks a little busy out here. Uh, needless to say, the coast, the coast guardsmen or coasties were uh, pretty active trying to chase these guys down. So it kind of gave the uh, the men at the Hither Plains Station some work. But once prohibition ended in 1933, the station did close down at that time. Not for good, but it did close down. Uh, you, you, you find that many of the uh, life-saving stations did shut down after World War I because of advances in equipment, boats that were able to cover more and more territories, and you found some stations closing. But when World War II came along, a lot of them were reactivated again for obvious reasons. They wanted to make sure they had plenty of uh, eyes and ears on the coastline. Uh, next one. This is kind of a grainy picture, but uh, this is what the property would have looked like in 1934. In 1940, there were plans to demolish the main building and erect a new one. And the whole station itself was reactivated like the others in World War II. Across the street from this station was the old, Par Par was the old Parsons Inn, which was renovated into a barracks for servicemen. The station itself was permanently abandoned in 1948, and soon after the buildings were torn down. Uh, I have never been able to find a record of when that happened, but we do know in 48 they did shut down, so it's, we presume it wasn't long after that they were removed. Yeah, these pictures I like. Uh, I call these before and after. This is the before picture. The, the road you're looking at is the old Montauk Highway, and you're looking east towards, Montauk Village would have been right around the bend. The building over here on the right, right there, that is the Hither Plain Station. That's what it would have looked like in 1924. Next picture, I took this one in 2016. Yeah, that where that truck is parked, to the right of the truck, that whole wooded area, that's where it was. So you can see the change. And this, uh, this is an aerial of the Hither Plains Station during World War II. It's hard to imagine they had like 30 stations all the way across the island and then they just dwindled down to the small handful there are today. Now this is not a Montauk station, but it certainly has relevance. This was the station at Napique, which is really not far away from Montauk anyway. The building itself is a beautiful structure. It was built in 1888, sustained some damage in the Great 38 Hurricane, as did a lot of the other station buildings at other sites. Uh, if you take a close look, though, you'll know the building's not on the ground. It's elevated. They were preparing to move the building. It was going to be relocated to Star Island in Lake Montauk to become Coast Guard Station Montauk's main building. So they basically lifted it up, carried it across the road, the railroad tracks, into the bay, put it on a barge, and ferried it around. 
here it is in transit. It's pretty cool, right? Yeah, this was in uh, this was taking place between November of 1954 and March of 1955. It did run into a bit of a delay. It ran aground uh, somewhere in a storm, and it took them a while to dislodge it. But eventually, it got there. I like this one. Here it is coming through the jetty into the lake. Someone told me that Carl Darensburg wife was actually somewhere there and at, at times when it was dark she was holding a lantern to help guide it in. I don't know how true that is, but uh, makes for an interesting story. Next. And here is this new home on Star Island today. You see the sign all the way at the top, United States Coast Guard. Uh, Montauk Station, and they did, they, they did a lot of improvements with them, and to me it looks like a beautiful building. But this station, of course, is active today, and uh, we, we at the Lighthouse are fortunate. Uh, the former uh, officer in charge there, Jason Walter, when he retired from there, uh, we grabbed him. And he is now our site manager at the Lighthouse, and this guy is top-notch. He has a great work ethic, and uh, we're moving forward very well under his command. So, he's kind of staying with the sea, in a way. Next. All right, now we're going to get into the wrecks. Uh, like I said, we're going to highlight 15 of them. Uh, they are in chronological order. This one is... Uh, from the Revolutionary War, this is a ship called the Culloden. This was a British vessel, and it was a fairly good size. It was 170 feet long. It had 74 cannons on board, 47 feet wide, and three decks, and 650 men. And it was anchored in Gardner's Bay during the Revolution uh, to defend the east end of Long Island from the French possibly trying to help the Americans out. Well, in January of 81, 1781, a uh, blizzard popped up. The other boats in the fleet managed to find safety wherever they went. The Culloden kind of took a zigzaggy kind of course and wound up in Fort Pond Bay and ended up grounding at a place called Wills Point, which today is Culloden Point. Now, the British on board the ship did not want the Americans to benefit from anything on board, which makes sense. So over the next two months, they removed every one of the 74 guns, anything else they could get their hands on, and then they burned the ship to the waterline. Talk about a complete job. The remains of the ship, obviously below water, today is listed on the National Register of Historic Places one of the few underwater sites, which means it is protected uh, from any removal of uh, artifacts. Next one. This is a model of the Culloden that is in our museum at the Lighthouse. If you haven't seen it, I definitely recommend uh, having a look at it. Uh, a gentleman by the name of Anthony Pagan did this over a three-year period. Uh, he has a workshop in Santa Maria Riches and uh, Model building is his love. He showed me some pictures of his garage turned into a workshop, and you saw several tables with works in progress. This guy really loves his craft. He used six different types of woods to create this model. But it, it's, it gets a lot of uh, notice and a lot of compliments. Okay. Uh, the next one doesn't have anything to do with this image, but uh, it was about a light ship, the Nantucket light ship. This one was kind of unusual, which is why I included it. Uh, the Nantucket light ship, because they did have light ships in certain places where you couldn't put a lighthouse. And this one was out at an area called the Nantucket Shoals, which is about 100 miles southeast of Cape Cod. So it was really in a remote part of the Atlantic. And on February 5th, 1855, a bad storm caused the ship to lose its anchorage. The ship drifted 113 miles to Montauk, which is why we're including it. The crew on board were safe, but the vessel was described by a local newspaper as 
at present, at present, at present tight, but in a very critical situation. What, what, what wound up happening is the ship was later salvaged and rebuilt at the Navy Yard, Navy Yard in New York City. Unfortunately, the information is very sketchy on this record. We don't really know too much beyond that. But it just struck me as an unusual uh, event in light of shipwrecks. But again, this was not a wreck, okay? Uh, it had some damage, but it was not really a wreck. And about uh, almost two years later, on December 14, 1856, a two-masted square rigged ship, which they call a brig, known as the Flying Cloud, ran ashore three miles west of the lighthouse at Montauk. It was sailing from Philadelphia to Charleston, Charlestown, Massachusetts, carrying 276 tons of coal. The ship was a total loss, although everybody on board was rescued, and they were rescued due to the aid of a man named Patrick Gould. Patrick Gould happened to have been a keeper at the Montauk Lighthouse from 1832 to 1849. <coughs> Some sources mistakenly say he was still the keeper there when he helped these people. He was not. He was stationed at the Ditch Plains Life Saving Station at the time. And because of his efforts in saving the crew, in January of 57, he was presented with a gold medal from the Life Saving Benevolent Association. Patrick Gould, by the way, is buried across the street in the South End Burial Ground. Now this image here might look familiar to some, maybe not. It's, it's taken by Shadmore, Shadmore State Park. And the reason I include this is because it was here that a ship called the John Milton met its end. Uh, this is a wreck that uh, I actually did a separate book on because I found it so interesting. I do have copies of it here if, it, if this intrigues you enough. The John Milton was originally built in uh, New Bedford, and it's, one of its first voyages went to San Francisco. Now keep in mind, in the 1850s, there was no Panama Canal. You had to go all the way down around South America and then all the way up again. So these guys were at sea for quite some time. But the problem is, once the ship landed in San Francisco, he lost the entire crew. Anybody guess why? Gold Rush. Oh, I got a smart group here. <laughs> well, that better be sharp the rest of the way. Yeah, they were all looking to get rich like a lot of other guys were in those days. But the captain of the ship, the man named Ephraim Harding, he realized, you know, he had, he had stops to make. He had to get back to uh, the East Coast. But he needed a crew. He basically went through the streets of San Francisco and threw together a group of men who were willing to sail with him. And with that done, they embarked back down south again. But he made one stop off the coast of Peru in the Chincha Islands to pick up about 2,000 pounds of guano. Oh, I sure hope the weather was good for them. <laughs> well, guano is something that is very effective in the, the manufacture of fertilizer. But when you first get it, it's not so pleasant. But uh, that's what they picked up, and they headed back up here. They were heading towards New York. And as they came back up the coast in uh, February of 1858, they ran into a very severe storm, blizzard, storm, nor'easter. From, from the uh, descriptions in the papers, it sounded like this was, a, this was a bad one. Now, what I'm going to tell you next is not, is not written as fact anywhere. It's a theory, and the theory is this, that as he was sailing along the south shore of Long Island, he was going around the point because he couldn't get into New York Harbor, he spotted a lighthouse with a steady beam on it, which he thought was Montauk Point. In reality, while he was gone, the Shinnecock light at Hampton Bays had been built, and it was made to flash, I'm sorry, it was made to be a steady beam. News didn't travel like it does today. Nobody's got cell phones, nobody's got computers, telephones. 
Word didn't travel. So Harding thought he had made Montauk Point, and since he thought he did, he went a little further east and then turned north in what he thought was open waters. And in the midst of the blizzard, the boat crashed into the rocks off the coast of Montauk at what is now Shadmore. Uh, all 33 on board perished. Some of the bodies were never recovered. And see, I, I always have to clarify this story by saying it's a theory, because uh, a couple years ago when I was telling this story at the lighthouse and I said, you know, the captain mistook the light and then everybody died, blah, blah, blah. This one little boy in the room raised his hand and said, well, if everybody died, how do you know that's what happened? <laughs> Sally, you remember that? Yes, I do. Yes, you know. One of my colleagues is here tonight. Sally and Stephanie, nice to see you. Uh, but you know, the parents looked at this kid with a little bit of annoyance, but I said, wait a minute. He's right. He's thinking. I said, don't discourage him. He is right. And that's when I clarified it, and I said, it's a theory. And it's a theory that, from what I've read, and as a historian, I think we all think it's something we can hang our hat on and say it certainly makes sense that that could have been the way it happened. Uh, the Montauk light, meanwhile, had been changed from a steady beam to a flashing signal at the same time uh, Shinnecock was made as fixed beam. It's all well and good, but if you didn't get the word out to everybody, it was kind of like playing Russian roulette with ships. And in this case, it the result was the loss of 33 people. 22 of the 33 bodies were recovered and were buried here again. That's right across the street, South End Burial Ground. And the sermon, the funeral service, was held at the Presbyterian Church. Again, right across the street, but a little bit down the block. The reverend at the time was a man named Stephen Mershon. And I wanted to quote something from his sermon. His sermon went on for about 12 pages, but I'm only talking about one paragraph, so don't worry. In, in most sermons can be long, can't they? It is not the member of our community whose name has often sounded in our ears. It is not the long-known friend. It is not the relative, not the dear member of our domestic circle that we have come to bury. No, we have come to bury the stranger. No, no father, no mother, no wife, no sister attends this burial to moisten the grave's cold earth with their tears. Wow. So, which is why, by the way, I called the book, They Were All Strangers. Because that's just what they were. But there were women hanging out the windows right here on Main Street, it was said, weeping, just watching the parade of uh, caskets going down the street to the, set, to the burial ground. And, and remember, this was in February, so there was snow on the ground, it was freezing cold. It didn't deter anybody. There was a crowd of people watching this. This was, this was big news. Uh, by the way, as far as the, the two different lights, eventually the word of the change became known and there were no more incidents other than the John Milton. This is uh, the bell from the John Milton. We have that in our museum. It's on loan to us from the Presbyterian Church right here in East Hampton. Appropriately, appropriately in our shipwreck room. Now we get to a ship called the Great Eastern. You can tell from the way this looks. It's a monster of a ship. Now this was neither a shipwreck nor a grounding, but it did leave its mark on Montauk history and on navigational charts. At the time this ship was built, it was the largest vessel in the world. It was 692 feet long, 120 feet wide, had six masts and five funnels. It was designed by a naval architect in England, and his name, if you can stand it, Isambard Kingdom Brunel. And in stature, the man was just about five feet tall, so I always said the name was bigger than he was. 
He was under a lot of pressure to build this vessel, so much so that he died of a stroke days before it sailed. So, and I, I tell you this for a reason. It, it was said the ship was jinxed. It had nothing but bad luck, and you're gonna find out now why. Its original purpose was to carry passengers, including immigrants to America, and it did so for several years. And then on the evening of August 27th, 1862, when it was sailing right off Montauk Point, it happened to have the misfortune to run into a rock at low tide, which was about a mile and a half east of the point. It happened late at night, and it ripped an 83 foot long gash in the hull. Nine inches, I'm sorry, nine feet wide, but due to the fact that when Brunel designed the ship, he designed it with a double hull. So the boat didn't sink, but it did kind of tilt to one side, which kind of upset the passengers a little bit. Because they thought, wow, something's, something's wrong here, maybe this boat's going down. But of course it didn't sink, and it made its way to the city, and it took three months to fix it. <coughs> By 1864, it was converted into a cable-laying vessel, and it was used to lay the first transatlantic cable in 1866. But here's where the jinx comes in. Right after they finished the job, the cable broke. <coughs> then the question came up, well, we could, let's get the ship out to lay another cable, and they said no. They got another ship to do it. And from that point on, it basically kind of faded into obscurity. It ended up being used as a, believe it or not, a floating musical in 1878 in England. And finally, it was used for advertising for a company called the Lewis Department Store in Liverpool. And then, between May of 1889 and November of 1890, over a year and a half, the entire ship was scrapped. And that was the only time it showed a profit. <laughs> so not a very exciting life for the uh, Great Eastern. Although, as we say, it, it left its mark on Montauk because the rock that it hit is forever known as the Great Eastern Rock on navigational charts. So it does have its place. And it has another place. Uh, we have a model of it in the museum. It's in the same room as the John Milton Bell. This was obtained uh, at an auction some years ago up in Maine, and we made space for it in the museum. And uh, again, like the, uh, the Culloden model, it gets a lot of uh, comments, a lot of compliments. Now this next, this next uh, this mishap, I guess we could say, was not a major one, but it just struck me as a little unusual, so I wanted to include it. It was a vessel called the John Buckaloo. And this one uh, took place on February 18, 1882. It was a schooner. It was sailing from Perth Amboy, New Jersey to Newport, Rhode Island with 180 tons of coal. An average ship, right? It ended up getting wrecked at Gin Beach in Montauk in a storm. Uh, there are those who think the name Gin, by the way, Gin Beach, comes from some connection with prohibition. That is not true. A gin is a term for a corral or an enclosure for animals. They called it a gin. So that's where that comes from. It has nothing to do with the alcohol. Although I'm sure Gin Beach probably was involved in prohibition at some point. What's interesting about the Buckaloo, though, uh, the location was beyond the scope of the service, I'm quoting. Far from any, any inhabitation, the nearest life-saving station being some miles distant on the other side of the island, with the high land of Montauk intervening. So Gin Beach actually faced a Block Island Sound, whereas the life-saving stations were on the ocean side. Now, it doesn't seem like it's that far away, but in a snowstorm, I guess it was very difficult. Aboard the ship was a captain and two crewmen. The two crewmen couldn't swim, so they remained with the ship. The captain wandered around until he came to second house. That had to be a heck of a wander. 
They took them to the Hither Plains Station for care, which wasn't too far away. And then lifesavers from Hither Plain and Ditch Plains went on a search for these other two men, only to find them dead. They were on the shore about a mile and a half west of the wreckage. This is a ship that's called the Lewis King. This one kind of comes under the heading of a little bit of humor. Uh, this ship was a schooner, was sailing from New York to Boston. It had a cargo of clay and dates. And it ran aground in a storm about a mile and a half west of the lighthouse. The captain apparently lost his bearings and mistook the Montauk light for the Watch Hill lighthouse. But everybody on board the ship got off safely. The keeper at the lighthouse was James Scott at the time. He didn't know anything was going on until one of the crew members from the ship came knocking at his door. The Ditch Plain Station didn't know either because according to the article it said that it was beyond their jurisdiction. And I'm kind of thinking, huh? And I thought they would have covered that area, but that was the ruling. Uh, the sailors on board, though, explained that they thought there was a man station at the lighthouse. But remember, at the lighthouse, it was only a boathouse. They didn't have a lighthouse crew, a life-saving station crew there. But Captain Scott at the lighthouse took the crew in and cared for them. But efforts to refloat the boat proved, proved to be fruitless. And uh, it basically sat there for almost three years until finally it was abandoned and just broke up. But what was interesting, uh, of the dates that were on board, the dates provided servings of date pudding in East Hampton towns for months. Uh, not long after, we have another steamer. This is uh, the George Apold. Came ashore at Montauk on January 9th, 1889. You notice most of these in the winter months, right? This was a steamer sailing from Providence, Rhode Island to Newport News, Virginia. It ran, however, it ran aground in clear weather about a mile and a half west of the lighthouse at 1.30 in the morning. Subsequent attempts to refloat the ship failed when harsh weather moved in, which really battered the ship very badly. And a great former East Hampton historian, Jeanette Rattray, who I refer to very often, said that there, uh, the, the cargo consisted of 100 barrels of New England rum, oh boy, a great quantity of calico in ugly colors, some rather coarse clothing, and heavy, cheap shoes. Well, P.S., people came to the beach and salvaged whatever they could. And Rattray went on to say, there was a great time matching up the shoes. <laughs> Children hated to wear them because their copper toes marked them as wreck shoes. So you can imagine the embarrassment on kids wearing these shoes at the school. Let's say, what's the matter? Your parents can't afford to buy a pair of shoes? So that's what happened. A newspaper many years later in 1959 said, men, women, and children joined in the treasure hunt coming with horses and farm wagons from miles away, some wagons becoming so overloaded with booty and passengers that they mired near the beach and had to be unloaded before they could be extricated. <laughs> and another newspaper at the time said, this, this was the most disgraceful exhibition of illegal greed in eastern Suffolk County's long history of free-for-all salvaging. <laughs> wonder what they really meant. <laughs> uh, then we have a, a ship called the Elsie Fay, kind of keeping in line with humorous stories here. Uh, the Elsie Fay was a three-masted schooner which was driven ashore in a snowstorm on February 17, 1893. So it was all in this late 80s, early 90s period. And it wrecked about two miles west of the lighthouse. It had sailed all the way from Grand Cayman, West Indies, heading for Boston, carrying logwood and coconuts. I think you have an idea of where I'm going now. The crew from the Ditch Plain Station was able to safely rescue the crew on board. But then, again, Jeanette Rattray, as always she could say it, she said people had coconuts in every style for about a year and were sure to be given coconut cake 
whenever they were invited to a company meal in Amagansett or East Hampton. And the Sag Harbor Express reported, merchants take warning, coconuts will be cheap for a while. <laughs> this is an image of a, a steamer uh, called the Chippewa, which ran into trouble on June 23rd, 1908. This one I picked because it had a remarkable rescue. They were rescued by a group of automobile drivers. Figure that one out. Apparently, when the ship was in distress, uh, the captain of the Ditch Plain Station was Carl Hedges, and because it was in the summer, the crew was on vacation. He was the only one there. And he appealed to local fishermen to help, but none of these fishermen had any knowledge of how to operate the, uh, the Lyle gun, the breeches buoy. So, but, the, but the fishermen ran off looking for help. And they came upon three cars of people about two miles from the lighthouse, who apparently, had, fortunately, had some knowledge. And they went to the Ditch Plain Station and operated the equipment. And they launched the breaches buoy and saved the people on board. Even the cargo was all recovered. The cargo, by the way, <laughs> where do you hear this? The cargo had lumber watermelons, alligators, and ostriches. Yeah. The ship itself was eventually refloated days later and it was towed to New York. Uh, the East Hampton Star at the time said almost every family within 100 miles of Montauk has eaten watermelon from the wrecked steamer. The fruit was peddled from wagons in many Long Island and Connecticut villages. So this stuff went far and wide. This ship was not going to have such uh, a funny ending to it. This is a 3,000 ton steamer called the Ontario, which was en route from Boston, I'm sorry, from Baltimore to Boston with 77 people on board, and it grounded three miles east of the Ditch Plains Life Saving Station which sounds like a, a harmless event, except at the time there was a fire raging in its hold. This was on April 8, 1912. And if you think about it, that's right around the time the Titanic went down. I think that was like a few days later. The cause of the fire was kind of easy to uh, determine. Its cargo consisted of cotton, resin, which is a very sticky, flammable substance that's extracted from trees and plants, turpentine, and whiskey. Whoa, boy. And then also, if you want to factor it all in, they also had shoes, peanuts, tobacco, oysters, kale. Kale. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm not a kale fan. And, and canned vegetables. Somehow I don't think they would have caused any trouble, except maybe a little of this. Ditch Plain Station and the Watch Hill, Rhode Island Station came over to help out. Everybody on board was saved. But the, the irony it is, they fought the fire for two days, and finally they gave up and the ship was abandoned, and just in time. Shortly after everybody was off the boat, an explosion blew, blew off the deck of the whole boat, leaving only the ship's hull. Wow. But for his invaluable service to the passengers and the crew, the Ditch Plains captain, Carl Hedges, and his wife were given a two-week vacation in Baltimore as guests of the Merchant and Miners Line, the owners of the ship. As to what happened to the remains, uh, it ended up getting towed to Promised Land in Napeag, and two weeks later, it was taken over to New London, Connecticut to be rebuilt. Now, I do touch on Prohibition with one wreck, even though the wreck technically was not in Montauk, but it was close enough. It was a ship called the Madonna V. It was a schooner. It was sailing from Nassau, Bahamas, and it was bound for St. Pierre in the Gulf of St. Lawrence, which is where the St. Lawrence River meets the Atlantic. And of course, what was it carrying? Whiskey. No surprise. But the reports varied as to just how much booze was on board this ship. Some reports thought maybe it was maybe about a few hundred cases. 
Other reports said it was as many as 3,000. And they were valued at $100 a case. The ship grounded at Napeeg in stormy weather. The crew itself was safely rescued by the Napeeg Coast Guard Station. But again, I looked to Jeanette Rattray for her take. And, and she says, lifelong teetotalers and even deacons of the church risked pneumonia <laughs> in the Montauk surf to bring the cargo ashore. Prompted, no doubt, by the inherited custom of wrecking and old New England principles against waste of any kind. <laughs> I love the way she put things. So that's, that's your little touch of prohibition. This one I'll be perfectly honest with you. It's nothing special, I just happened to have a picture and I thought it looked good to throw in. It's a 40 foot dredger, it was called the Red Sail. And it came ashore right below the lighthouse. And this happened on August 20th, 1946. There were two men aboard, and they jumped safely to the beach. But it, it just makes a nice shipwreck picture anyway, kind of typical of what we're talking about. Henry, Henry. Yes. That's, um, that's uh, Halliday. That's Wasn't that the one you and I talked about? Yeah, that's Yeah, I remember you and I had that conversation yeah. about that. Yeah, because he's in the sh uh, a book that has to do with the ship. Well, now that we've had a look at uh, pretty much an average uneventful wreck, take a look at this. Tell me what we're talking about. Pelican. No, that didn't take long, did it? Pelican. And call me crazy, but just when I saw the headline, the way it was printed, it still gives me chills when I read it. This was a New York Times front page on September 2nd, which, which uh, you can tell the numbers are certainly not correct because there were a total of 45 people killed and quite a number were, I think 19 were missing, even though they originally had 28 missing. But uh, unfortunately, I don't have any pictures of the Pelican here, but I think this kind of simply says it. Um, I think most people know the story, but for the sake of those who don't, uh, we have a display in the museum that focuses on that. And uh, the Pelican was one of many party boats that was docked in Fort Pond Bay, and uh, apparently was quite popular with people from the city. They would come out on a uh, Long Island Railroad train known as the Fisherman's Special, which would start out early in the morning. And it was said that when the ship, the, uh, I'm sorry, when the train pulled into Montauk, it didn't even have time to come to a stop. These fishermen were leaping off the ship, up off the train to get to their favorite boat. That's, I guess, how superstitious they must have been. But on this particular day, September 1st, which was Labor Day weekend, it was like the last hurrah for the season, uh, the weather wasn't that promising. So some of the other boats elected not to go out. Pelican did. But he, but now you had less ships going out, but you still had a whole bunch of sailors on the dock. And some boats took on more people. And the captain of the ship was a man named Eddie Carroll, who, from what I've read, I like to describe him as the man who just couldn't say no. He would just say, all right, come on in, come on aboard, come on aboard, come on aboard. His ship was able to handle 25 fishermen comfortably. That's counting fishing gear. When he sailed out, he had 64 on board. And there is a picture, I think it might have been the Daily News or one of the city papers, and it showed the boat leaving the harbor area. And I remember when I first saw the picture, my first question was, how did they fish? Because they were like literally sardines. They were like right next to one another. And you figure they've got the gear too. I mean, it had to be a cramp. So they sailed it through. Um, uh, Block Island Sound, they went through an area called the Rip, right off the point, got through that okay. They went out to a place only a couple of miles out, dropped anchor and fished for a while. Now this was in the early morning, and in the morning things were cloudy but calm. But then around noontime, the wind started to pick up, the, the 
waves started to pick up, and things really started getting a little hairy, and people on board the boat were getting a little antsy, and uh, it was finally suggested to turn around and go back. Well, Captain Carroll decided, yeah, I guess we better, and as he headed back in, one of his two engines conked out. So now he's limping along on one engine. He gets to a spot that's really only about one mile northeast of the point, which one mile is not that far, but the waves were tossing this ship around like a cork in the water. And the people on board panicked to the point where many of them ran to one side of the boat, which didn't help. So now the boat is listing, and just the perfect thing to happen, as the boat is listing one way, a rogue wave comes in and smacks the boat from the other side and flips the whole thing over. Just about everybody is thrown into the water. And... You know, there were some other boats in the area that were able to fish out some people and save them. And when all was said and done, as I said, uh, 45 people were either found dead or lost, and 19 were saved. And there's a gentleman, I always like to tell this story, there's a gentleman that I used to work with at the Lighthouse, <coughs> longtime Montauk resident, Vinnie, Vinnie Grimes may be known to some of you. He, he just turned 90 in September. He's never at a loss for a good Montauk story. And they're funny too, some of them I could not print. <laughs> but he gets very serious when he talks about the Pelican. Because in 1951, if you know your history, the Korean War was going on. He was stationed in the Navy, he was in California, but he happened to be home on leave that weekend. <coughs> And the authorities apparently knew that, called his house and said to the mother, is Vinny home? And they said, she says, yeah. And they said, we need him down at the dock. Now. That's all he had to hear. He raced down to the dock and assisted in the recovery. But the job fell to him to open the cabin door. Now, what I'm going to say is going to be a little grisly, but this is the way it was. He told me when he opened the door, he found ten bodies inside. <clears throat> but, but like he said to me, it wasn't just finding the ten bodies. There were claw marks on the wall. But like he said, there was an inch plywood there. They weren't getting out. <clears throat> Not only that, there were claw marks on each other. They were attacking one another to get out that little door. <coughs> and... In a state of panic, you're not thinking rationally. The water would come up and they drown. So it was a horrible, horrible tragedy. It is billed as the worst maritime disaster in the history of Montauk. Now you figure, you know, wrecks occurred back in the 16, 17, 1800s. This was only 1951. So, <clears throat> relatively speaking, it's not that long ago. It's about 60, 60 it'd be 68 years this year. Not that long ago. But it was that incident that caused the Coast Guard to finally look into the matter and impose restrictions on boats in, in terms of the size of the boat. In other words, capacity limits. <clears throat> but it was like after the cat was out of the bag kind of thing. And in our museum, we have a, a framed display of um, a Newsday article that was printed in 2001 on the 50th anniversary of the event, and there's an image of a lady in the picture. You've seen it, right, Sal? Yeah. Uh, White-haired lady, her name is uh, Irene Stein. This woman lost her husband and her father on the Pelican. And that, that's, it's quite a moving thing to read. Well, two years ago, I happened to be walking back in there because when I see people reading it, I relate this story of the Pelican, graphics and all. And these people, when I walked up to them, I said, would you like to hear the story of the Pelican? And this little girl, she looked to be about 15, she said, oh, we know the story of the Pelican. I said, oh, really? I said, how do you know it? Points to the lady, that's my grandmother. And I said, well, this is a 2001 picture. I said, is she still alive? And I guess it was the father said, she very much is alive. She's here with us today. I said, where is she? She was in the parking lot on one of those swing benches. <laughs> Good historian that I am, I went right out there to find her. 
And she had this big, gracious smile. She patted the seat next to me and told me to sit with her for a minute. And we rocked back and forth for a couple of minutes. The bench faced Block Island Sound, the spot. And so at one point, she just reached over and tapped my knee. And she said, without looking at me, she looked straight ahead and nodded. She goes, it was out there, wasn't it? And I had chills going down my back. And I said, yeah, I said it was. And then she just looked at me with this smile. And she said, you know, she said it's been so long ago. She said, but I still miss that. And she's, I think she's about 90 now. She lives right here on the island. She's up in the shore and waiting river somewhere. So I told the family at some point, she should come back and visit the lighthouse. Come visit us. And, uh, we'll show her a good time. But that's one of the things I really, I, 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 I say enjoy, but not, not as you would enjoy a good drink or something. I, I enjoy meeting people who have a connection with history. And uh, even though it was a somber one, uh, I was very glad to have met her. I always wonder what ever happened to her. And the last wreck is really, uh, it's really the, the boat all the way on the far right. This is the USS Baldwin. This was on April 16, 1961. It was a 1,700-ton destroyer that was being towed from Boston to Philadelphia. But on its way, the tow line snapped about 23 miles south of Montour Point, and it drifted to Turtle Cove near the lighthouse and ended up grounding only 50 yards from the beach, which unfortunately resulted in the rupture of oil tanks on board and the appearance of an oil slick. So they had that problem to deal with. Then they began efforts to haul this great ship off. So they attached the cable line. And in the process of doing that, there was a sailor operating the crank. The cable snapped and shot back at him and killed him. The ship itself, a couple weeks later, was finally dislodged. It was towed about 90 miles southeast of Montauk and sunk. The ship was actually going to be sunk anyway because it was, you know, it was just they were just they had no need of the ship anymore. But as you can see from these 15 wrecks, or mishaps, I like to say, they all have something different about them. They're not all, a, when you say shipwreck, you don't think, you, everybody thinks right away of a ship totally destroyed, bodies on the beach, cargo lost. It didn't always happen. It didn't always happen. And sometimes those lifesavers were there to make sure that uh, lives were saved and as much cargo as it could be saved. <coughs> And in that light, we have the Lost at Sea Memorial. I'm sure many of you have seen this if you've been to the lighthouse. It's actually at the very end of Long Island. When they say the end, that is the end. This is uh, a sculpture that was designed by Malcolm Fraser. It's an eight foot tall fisherman in a dory on top of a seven foot granite base. The site was donated by the Montauk Historical Society for this purpose, and it was dedicated on October 10th, 1999. <clears throat> the pedestal underneath, you can't see it from that shot, it, can, it has the engravings of 121 commercial fishermen who lost their lives at sea. Not necessarily in the waters you're seeing in the picture. They were people from like East Hampton, Amagansett, Montauk, who lost their lives at sea. They could have been anywhere, but they were from the East End. But the monument to me, it's, it always serves as like a poignant reminder of the risks fishermen take every time they venture out. I just kind of like this shot for, mm -hmm. for, the, for the shadow. It, it is, uh, you're able to walk right over to it if you visit the museum. And the names that are engraved are in chronological order. It includes the date, the age of the person if it's known, and the name of the person itself. And you'll be interested if you look at it, you'll see a long run of names on there, about 12 names from September 21st, 1938. 
which was the big hurricane. Those people were literally swept away from Montauk in a tidal wave, never found again. And you know, people, I've had people talk to me about this uh, display and they say, well, I guess it's only in bad weather. I said, well, I remember someone telling me a story about a couple of guys went out on a boat one day and uh, it was a sunny day and the water was calm. They went to drop anchor and the guy's leg got caught in the line. He went down with the anchor. Like I said, there's always a risk anytime you go out. And to conclude, uh, I wanted to quote from uh, a gentleman named Dennis Means. He wrote a book called A Heavy Sea Running, The Formation of the U.S. Life Saving Service. He published this in 1987. <clears throat> from the and this is about the lifesavers. From the beginning, its primary goal had been to save lives and property from the ravages of sea and storm. Between 1871 and 1915, the service assisted 28,121 disasters and shipwrecks and preserved the lives of 174,682 persons and 288,871,237 dollars worth of vessels and cargo. Although mere cold statistics to warm and complacent Americans today, such figures are indicative of a legacy of valor and skill, the likes of which this country may never see again. Thank you.